Welcome to Intro to Cultural Anthropology. I'm your uh, professor, Jason Paling. Uh, this is Lecture 5, Psychological Anthropology. We're filming uh, here on the campus of uh, Nashua Community College in uh, scenic Nashua, New Hampshire. In this lecture, Psychological Anthropology, we will be dealing with social identity, personality, and gender. In this lecture, we will discuss how do we socialize and humanize our next of kin, or acclimate, uh, or uh, acclimate, sorry, if you will, new members of our own society and communities. In this lecture, we will be discussing some of these issues, but first let's start um, with an important definition, and that is, what is enculturation? Enculturation is the social learning process by which a society's culture is acquired by those who are born into it, as well as who become those who become members of that society in other ways, such as immigration. Uh, like, unlike other creatures that share our planet, uh, human babies do not have the basic needs to take care of themselves. While a child grows up, they are taught their culture in their household. The actual process, though, of enculturation begins at birth, before birth, uh, as many cultural factors are at work. For instance, uh, before a baby is born, there's a lot of effort into what kinds of food or what appropriate drink is allowed for a pregnant mother. Uh, a lot of energy, uh, money, and effort goes into determining how to decorate the baby's room. What colors are uh, necessary for the development of a child when they're in their living quarters? Um, what noises or sounds are appropriate for the development of a fetus? Um, think of for a moment about the birth of a child in our society. We decide early what colors to decorate the infant's room based on their gender, right? Uh, what kind of toys do children play with at their early stages of childhood? When we talk about this, we talk about socialization. Another important term, socialization, is the anthropological and psychological approach used to describe the development through the influence of parents and others. These patterns of behavior in children are to conform to the social and cultural expectations that the society places on them. Uh, you're going to read more about examples of socialization in Elizabeth Chin's Ethnically Correct Doll. So after our lecture, make sure that you read this ethnographic work by Elizabeth Chin. Uh, her examination of African American children in uh, Norwalk, uh, Connecticut and uh, what appropriate to uh, toys do children play with and how it, socialization influences their behavior. Um, before we continue, it's important that we discuss and define gender. Gender is the way that members of two sexes are perceived, evaluated, and expected to behave. In our society today, we have certain expectations that genders have to live up to. Think about this for a minute uh, and reflect on this, some food for thought. How do the sexes in our society are expected to behave? Take a moment to think about that. Uh, as a child, going back to the development of, of children, as a child becomes enculturated into our society, we say that once we really become a functional member is, of a culture is when we become self-aware. Um, self-awareness is the anthropological definition um, of our ability to identify oneself as an individual, to reflect on oneself, and to evaluate oneself. We really don't become functional members of a culture until we become self-aware. Your textbook will discuss the basic fields of thought in which humans become self-aware. And those are objective orientation, spatial orientation, temporal orientation, and normative orientation. Please take a moment after the video to read the definitions of each of these uh, basic schools of thought on how we become self-aware, become familiar with some of the examples. Let's just quickly go over them in this video. Objective uh, object orientation is the way that we perceive the environment and things in our environment. Spatial orientation is the ability to get from one place to another. Temporal orientation 
is how we perceive the sense of place and time, such as how we perceive past, present, and future, and how we can relate between these two, these three different time periods. Uh, normative orientation is how our values, ideals, and principles, our culture, uh, are included in our behavioral environment, and with that, how gender roles are perceived and learned in normative orientation. Um, at this point in the uh, video, we're going to end this segment and we'll move on to another. But at the end of this segment, think about how gender roles have influenced our culture and how our culture influences gender. Take a little break here. And this will be the second part of uh, psychological anthropology. In this next video, we're going to go into uh, greater depth in psychological, the psychological analytical approach. Uh, it's important to discuss some of the important early anthropologists who influenced psychological anthropology. One of those being Edward Sapir. He is one of the leading founders of the psychological approach. Um, he was influenced by Sigmund Freud and the, uh, his collaborator and, uh, at the time, uh, anthropologist Alfred Kroeber. Uh, his contribution to psychology and anthropology was that the, uh, he believed that the study of the nature of relationships between different individual personalities is important in, for the way in which culture and society develops. So I think it's important at this point to define what personality is. The anthropological definition of, anthropo of personality is the way that a person thinks, feels, and behaves. Another important anthropologist to the field of psychological anthropology um, from the same university, uh, the Columbia New School uh, of Anthropology, was Margaret Mead, uh, who, by the way, had a short affair with uh, Sapir before she went off to study in Samoa. She was very influential in psychological anthropology. She believed uh, through her work in Samoa that one's sexual orientation evolved through life. Um, and this is in her works, The Coming of Age uh, in Samoa. This important ethnographic work is not without some critics. Um, the Columbia School was pivotal for its contribution to psychological uh, anthropology. Another important and overlooked member of uh, the field was Ruth Benedict, who at one point was the head of the department at uh, Columbia. Uh, in her books, uh, The Pattern of Culture, uh, which was a cross-cultural uh, look at uh, behavior, and also the uh, chrysanthemum and the sword, which these books looked at behavior of cultural groups and characterized the personality of the members of these cultures. Uh, these are leading and important researchers who have contributed to our understanding of personality. Um, psychological anthropologists examine how cultures socialize and enculturate new members. They have two schools of thought of how, uh, how people become enculturated. And it's either through dependency training or independency training. Your book discusses uh, the difference between independence and independence training. I want you to become familiar with the difference, but I'm going to give you a general uh, description of each. Dependency training is child rearing that fosters compliance in the performance of assigned tasks and dependency on the, dependency on the domestic group. Independence training is different where child rearing practices that foster independence, self-reliance, and personal achievement. Please read uh, tech, the textbook, chapter six, and what child rearing practices or types of training do you think you would ascribe to? Do you fall under the dependency theory or the independency theory? Read the examples that uh, are in your textbook and then consider um, what if you were to raise a child, what line of thought of how you would rear your child would you fall under? Then, after you do that, ponder this. When you think of the nation as a whole, 
what are our society's core values? What are your own personal core values? When I say core values, I mean the values promoted by a particular culture. As we rear our children, what are the values and beliefs, essentially our culture, that you want them to promote, right? Um, as we read and learn about gender and personality and how gender and personality has influenced our culture and vice versa, consider that again, culture is always changing and adaptive. That our binary concept of male and female is not really universally recognized. In your chapter, you're going to read about intersexual and transgenders. I want you to become familiar between the difference between intersexual, which is biological and cultural, and uh, understand uh, the history of uh, how anthropologists have recognized intersexual and transgenders. Uh, know the definitions of eunuchs and the castori. Um, know the difference between intersexuals and transgenders, transgenders, and we will be watching at the end of this video lecture another ethnographic video on the two-spirit, or the derogatory term being Badachi, people of Native North America. Uh, please be aware of the questions that are asked in the video and consider when watching these, uh, the film these questions. And lastly, ponder this when we talk about transgender. Have we created cultural space for a third gender? And is it time to have a discussion about third gender groups in our, uh, our society and our culture? Uh, finally, in this video lecture, as we end this video lecture, uh, let's shed light on some of the horrific, uh, let's think about some of the horrific tragedies that have befallen our country and especially New England in the last couple of months. This is again 2013. How do we determine normal from abnormal personalities? This is a very difficult and controversial topic. You know, what is our basis for judgment of abnormal and normal? How do we determine what is normal and abnormal behavior? For instance, recently our views of homosexuality have changed significantly in this country from the last couple of decades. Uh, even 50 years ago, it was considered abnormal behavior to be homosexual, but that is now uh, changing in our society. So how do we judge or determine what is abnormal or normal behavior? Um, it's important for us to understand some of our cultural bound syndromes that are in our society. Read some of the cultural bound syndromes that are in other societies and try to figure out where and how these behaviors or these abnormal behaviors originate. Are they from individuals whose perceptions of oneself is askewed or um, are they against our cultural norms? For example, when we talk about bulimia or anorexia amongst members of our society. This is a mental disorder, but where does it originate from? Is it from um, concepts of oneself and not living up to the expectations that are placed on by our culture, or are they from somewhere else? Such as, are they for forces of globalization or from issues of child rearing and socialization? Um, again, as it is 2013, as we discuss the issues um, in our own society, one of the more important issues is gun control. We are becoming very aware that we need to address psychological disorders and that psychological and medical anthropologists will provide invaluable insight on the prevailing problems in our healthcare system. They'll also provide information where do these, disorder, these uh, disorders stem from and how are we to uh, prevent or discourage abnormal behavior and also to prevent people who have mental disorders from purchasing or requiring weapons. Uh, we all also talk about and, and consider that uh, medical and uh, psychological anthropologists um, in a multi-ethnic society, it's not always easy 
to, to prescribe drugs to certain subcultures. It's probably, in some cases, not the safest and cheapest fix to solve some of our um, cultural uh, bound syndromes with just medicines. Um, there are other uh, ways in which uh, anthropologists and uh, sociologists and psychologists would um, deal with individuals or people who are suffering from mental disorders in our society other than throwing uh, prescriptions at these, at these individuals. So again, when we think about our society and we think about um, some of the mental disorders that we might have and some of the problems that persist with men, uh, people who suffer from mental disorders, we need to figure out where the problems originate and how we can resolve um, the... Now, I'll have to edit this part here, but um, how where these problems originate and how we can treat them in a more efficient means. And if we have an open discussion uh, about these um, disorders, maybe we can get to the heart of the matter, and that might be our cultural expectations and our issues with personality and self-awareness. So again, uh, after we conclude this video lecture, make sure that you watch the ethnographic uh, video on Two Spirit People. Uh, and uh, make sure that you read Elizabeth Chin's ethnographic uh, work on ethnically correct dolls. We will see you again in lecture six and have a good day.